Hallelujah. King of glory, enter this place right now, Lord. God, settle in the hearts of your people. Fill us this morning, God. Rain from heaven. A fresh and anew this morning, God. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your sweet presence. We thank you, Master, that you've come down from your throne to meet with us. We thank you this morning, Father. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we give the Lord one more hand clap? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Children, you're dismissed at this time. You can head on out. Amen. Amen. Praise team. Thank you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. How many ready for the King of Glory to show up in their life today? Amen. Amen. God's glory. King of glory. Hallelujah. Praise the living God. Amen. Well, I'm ready to get into the Word this morning. I hope you are. Amen. Amen. We're going to have a good time this morning. Amen. How many of you came expecting to hear something from God today? Amen. Praise God. If you came expecting, he's here to deliver. Amen. Amen. Look, I know we've been standing for just a moment, but if we could stand for just a few more seconds for the reading of God's word, it's the reverence of the Lord, not for me. If you're physically able, if you're not, understand. Let me go on and break out my bifocals. I ain't, I ain't claiming nothing. I just had a little difficult to see in here lately. Praise the Lord. It's all right. It's all good. Now I got a daggum fingerprint on my thing. I can't see. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We're going to be in John chapter 3, verse 30 this morning. We're going to read it, uh, several verses right there. John 3, chapter th- I mean, John chapter 3, verse 30 says, He must increase, but I must decrease. Somebody say, I need him to increase. You need him more than that, don't you? I need him to increase. I need him to increase. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. And he who comes from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard, that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. The Father loves the Son and and has given all things into his hand. And he who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and who does not believe the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God shall abide on him. Father, I thank you this morning for your word. I thank you, God, this morning that you met us here, Lord. You was already here. You was just waiting for some hungry people to come in here. Now, God, your word tells us that you will feel those that hunger and thirst. God, I'm hungry for you this morning. I believe the people have come hungry for you as well. And I'm asking you, Lord, to be true to your word because you you said your word would not return void. And, God, I'm asking you to feel those that are hungry this morning, God. Those that are thirsty for you, Lord, I pray today, God, that they would be filled to, to an overflowing abundance, oh, God. Let their cup run over this morning, Jesus. I'm asking you to show up in this house today, God. Do what only you can do, Lord. Tear down the strongholds, oh God. Break the chains of hell, oh God. Break addictions off of life, oh God. I'm asking you this morning, Lord. Fill us full of the Holy Spirit. Fill us full of power. Fill us full of glory. Fill us full of the authority of Jesus. Now, Master, I ask you today. Anoint my lips to preach and teach your word. Anoint the ears to hear it and the hearts to receive it. I pray, Father, that no one leaves this place the same way they came in. Father, may we leave this place radically changed for Jesus. Now, Father, we thank you, Lord. God, I speak to this atmosphere right now. I cast down every negative thought that the enemy would try to put in somebody's head right now, God. 
Lord, I cast down the, the thought of doubt or fear or unbelief right now in the name of Jesus, oh God. Lord, I speak life into this atmosphere. I speak power into this atmosphere. I speak a heart of reception this morning, oh God. I'm asking you, Lord, I speak to stir up the gift inside of you, young Timothy. God, I'm asking you today, Lord, send your spirit and send it with fire. Now, God, I thank you this morning, and I give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we give God one more hand clap? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Well, we'll talk to you for just a minute about video games this morning. Amen. Amen. I'm not here to, debate, uh, to, to open up a debate or discussion about video games, whether they're good or bad or, or anything like that, or do they have too much violence in them, or do they not have enough violence for some people. Uh, you know, there are bad games out there, but there's good games out there too, and I like to play video games. I like video games, and I, I like certain ones. I like ones that challenge me a little bit and make me think and adventurous games, I couldn't think of the word in the first service, it's like have an adventure to it, you know, where you got to maybe walk through the forest or something, you got a little maze you got to figure out, I like games like that right there, but you know, there's some games that are not suitable for kids, but as parents, it's up to us to, to make sure that our kids are, are playing proper games, right, and games have ratings on them, age limits, and, and sometimes the age limit is, may, may say uh, T for teen, but it really may not be nothing to it, and you got to research these things out, amen. So, so don't get mad at your neighbor if they're letting their kid play a teen, teen game and they're nine years old. That you might not know what's going on there. But video games can be just as graphic as a TV show or a movie. I mean, they, they, show, people, uh, they show people without clothing sometimes and stuff like that. And they can be just as graphic as you watching TV. So you got to watch these things. But video games are, are here to stay. They're not going anywhere. I, I guarantee you, everybody in this room probably has a video game in their house. Oh, I don't have video games. If you got a cell phone, you probably got a game on there, and it's a video game. Everybody has video games. So they're not going anywhere. But when I grew up, I had video game. My first video game I had that was on TV anyway was an Atari. Oh, yeah. The old Atari had the old joystick, a little bit button right there. Amen. Yeah. My first game was Space Invaders. How many remember Space Invaders? Oh, yeah, look at there. Oh, yeah. look, my dad right now, if he's watching, he'd be like, oh, God, he's going to bring back a nightmare. <laughs> I sat there and played that game, me and my sister, and now you hear, boom, 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 boom. Then he'd start back over. And boom, 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 boom. And he'd get faster and faster as he's coming down. You'd be like, boom, 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 you know. Oh, that sounded like asteroids, didn't it? That brought back asteroids to some of y'all, didn't it? Bing, 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 bing. But we had video games, man. They were good games, and I played them games sometimes 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning if I could. And when I, well, for Christmas, I got up about 3 o'clock in the morning and, and played that video game. My mom and dad told me, they said, we had nightmares for three months. <laughs> we heard that stinking. Because he could, all he could do was afford an Atari for us. He couldn't afford but one game, and so that's the only game we had. And it's the one that thing didn't, didn't heat up or smoke as much as I played it. Because I played that thing, I'm telling you. And, uh, but, you know, video games are, are not always bad. There's some good games out there. But video games have different levels to them. You know, and you start out playing some video games, and the bad guys, they're not real tough. You can, you know, you think you're a superhero the way you can just beat them up all the time. You know, when you hit one of them or something like that, their damage in, uh, decreases so much, and they can hit you, and yours just barely goes down, and you got this thing whipped. It's just kind of easy to defeat the enemy in it. The levels are not too complicated. You can kind of figure them out how to go through the maze and stuff like that without much, putting much thought into it. But as the game progresses, the game gets a little bit more difficult. It's not always real easy. The enemies start to get harder. They start giving out more damage and they become harder to defeat. Instead of now, you throw a cast and a blow and their damage going all the way down. Now it's the other way around. Some of the bosses, they can hit you, and, and you out with two hits. Start getting a little bit harder. Levels become more complex. Mazes and puzzles and stuff become more difficult. But in all the games, generally now, especially when you go through certain levels of the game, at the end of a level, 
there's generally a boss. And he's like the biggest, maddest guy there is, or whatever it may be. And you have to beat him. And he, he's, he's tougher than anybody that you've, you've uh, played against so far. He's one of them when he hits you one time, I mean, you're out. You have to start back over again. And some games let you start right back right there, and that's the ones I like. Because I don't like to have to start all the way back over. And God forbid I didn't save it, and I got beat like that. And then I'm very upset. But most time it takes several tries to beat the boss. You just don't go in there and whip up on him right quick like. So how are you able to defeat the enemy as it gets stronger in these games? You level up. Every time you complete a level, you get a little stronger. Maybe you get a, a better weapon or you, your energy bar, your life bar, instead of being this long, is now this long. There's always something to it that's an advantage at each level that you defeat. You level up. And so you, become, uh, you get a new tool or a new skill or something like that that's essential for you to be able to beat the next boss that you're fixing to go into battle against and the next enemy along the way to there. So no matter what game you're playing, there's always different levels to it. Even in Atari, when I was talking about Space Invaders, you got to clear all of them on that one level, but there's another level. There's always another level to it. But imagine reaching the boss without ever leveling up. You probably wouldn't get up to that one boss. You wouldn't get nowhere else. So some of you don't even know what I'm talking about right here, but there's a game called Zelda. And at the end of it, the, the, the boss was Ganon. And I beat Ganon. And I mean, it took me probably like, I don't know, I probably had, if I sat there and counted hours, I probably had 150 hours in that game. Now, this was a long time ago when it first came out on Nintendo 64. And some of y'all don't even know what that is. But that's when it came out on Nintendo 64. And I sat there and would lose sleep over this, playing that game. But you, you imagine trying to beat him without the master sword that you had to have. Or, or imagine this, a lot of you know Mario. How about trying to beat Bowser without being big Mario or something like that? Or, or try to beat Darth Vader without a lightsaber. Guess what's going to happen? Nothing. You ain't going to beat him. you got to have these tools and these things or you're not going to defeat them. You don't have enough uh, uh, energy in your bag, so to speak. You don't have the right tool. You don't have enough strength. And you can easily be defeated by the enemy unless you level up. And if you don't level up, all at once across the screen is going to say, you lose. And if you like me, you want to pick something up and throw it at the TV. And my wife has to say, hey, you can't do that in front of the kids. I'm, I, I know. I'm just playing. Y'all leave the room for a minute. I need to keep one of them stress balls around me so I can just throw it at the TV or something. I don't know. I, just, I get so into games like that because I don't like to lose. But life is like a video game. Sometimes it's just like a video game. You start off, everything's nice and easy as a young kid. You don't have really much to, to do. You don't have any bills. At least mine don't. And if you have got your kids to pay bills at a young age, let me know how you've done that because I'd like to implement it in my family. But they don't have bills and they don't have many concerns of the world. They just kind of go around. Mom and Dad does everything for them. They might have a little bit of peer pressure, but it's usually not something that's going to devastate them or hurt them for the rest of their life sometimes, but there's not a lot of demand on them. But as they progress in life, it gets a little tougher, and they start taking on responsibility, and the enemy, uh, such as peer pressure, begins to play and become a stronger influence in their life. Like now it's uh, try a cigarette or, or let, let's do a little bit of drugs or let's take a drink of alcohol or, or let's watch pornography on the internet or, or better yet, let's go have sex instead of watching it or let's go steal something or let's go beat somebody up. Peer pressure falls into place and they have a lot more things falling on their shoulders and they start to watch the news maybe a little bit and the media starts to influence their thinking as well, shaping their mind and and let them think it's okay to, to do whatever you want to do. It doesn't matter. Everybody else is doing it. And of course, no, no teenager, no young person wants to be counted as uh, being left out. Everybody wants to fit in. And the world teaches us that we must conform to the way of the world. No, I don't worry about what the Christians are doing. Rebel against God. Don't speak the name of Jesus anywhere. Just just do what you want to do. Have it your merry own way. You know, even Nike says, just do it. Just do it. What is it McDonald's says, have it your way? Just do it. Is that Burger King? 
Burger King, look at there. That's why I don't know, because I don't eat there, because they say that. <laughs> Thinking Burger King. But why do we do what we do as Christians? We try to walk a straight line. We, we try to keep uh, uh, live right. We try to bring our children up right. And, and the world tries to throw everything against us by pulling prayer out of school, doing this and doing that. Everything that a Christian tries to do, the world tries to do against it. And as society continues to, to move away from God, they move further away from us as well. And the problem is some of us as Christians are trying to stand up to these things on our own power. And we can't do it. we got to level up. we got to level up. Whether you're a child or a youth, a young adult, or even an adult, you'll fail if you try to defeat the enemy of this world in your own power. You're not strong enough. You don't have enough energy. And we often think that it's only the younger people that struggle with things. But I'm here to tell you, it's not just younger people that struggle. They're, adults are not strong enough. We have peer pressure too. Some of you may work in a workplace that's not Christian orientated. Or oriented. And what happens then? You're under peer pressure. Maybe you give ear to a joke you don't need to listen to. Or maybe you start telling jokes you don't need to tell. It happens. Temptation is all around us. And if we're not careful and we don't level up, we'll fall right back into sin by listening to the temptation. So we must level up in our walk. And Jesus realized the battle that we would face in this world, and it would be great. In John 16, 33, he said, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you have, tri have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Praise God that he has overcome the world. He told us that we're going to have problems. So don't think as a Christian you're not. You're going to have tribulations in this world. But glory be to God. He told us that we would have it. But he would give us the peace that we would need. He would send the comforter to help us go through these trials and tribulations. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Even though we have struggles and problems. Because we've overcome, he's overcome the world. We're still going to have these things. But he's here to help us. We need Jesus to help take us to the next level. We can never be at a place and say, well, I can't go no higher with the Lord. Until we cross uh, over into heaven, we can always go to the next level with the Lord. Amen. So we need to help us level up. Acts 1.8 says, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me in both Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. The Holy Ghost gives us the power to overcome the temptations of this world. And we can't fight them on our own. So Jesus fights it for us by the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. The Holy Ghost is Jesus Christ coming alive inside of us. Mm. Hallelujah. How do we get this Holy Ghost? How do we get this Holy Ghost, Pastor? Well, you must repent. You got to repent. You got to ask God into your heart. Ask Jesus Christ into your heart. Ask Him to forgive you of your sins, to wash you and cleanse you by the blood. Tell Him you're sorry for everything. And you know what I like to do? Just start just start calling on the name of Jesus. Just start calling on the name of Jesus. You do what the Bible tells you to do in Romans 10 and 9 and 10 to, to confess the Lord with your mouth and believe in the heart. And then after that, you just start, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I thank you. I thank you, Jesus, for everything you do. When I'm praying and I just feel like I've run out of things to pray, I just, I, Jesus, I thank you. You're, you're so good to me, Jesus. And I just start naming the name of Jesus. There's something about the name of Jesus. Like, you just start saying the name. And all at once, the Spirit of God will fall on me. And I'll go right into my prayer language and, and get edified and built up. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's doing something inside of me because I'm giving Jesus all the praise. Some of us just need to praise Jesus a little bit more. How will you know when you got the Holy Spirit? Now, I'm speaking on this day because today's Pentecost Sunday, right? How you know you got the Holy Ghost? Well, the evidence of receiving the Holy Ghost is that you speak in tongues. Well, Pastor, how, why do you say that? Well, because in five of the six accounts in the Bible, when they received the Holy Ghost, it says they were speaking or they spoke with tongues. Now, there's one thing about speaking with the Holy Spirit or speaking to the, uh, the Holy Ghost speaking through you. You've got to open your mouth. Oh, Revelation. Revelation, right there. 
Some of people, and I'm not, I'm not being funny. I'm just being serious for a minute. Some people believe that they can come down and they can stand and the Spirit of God will just go right there. And I'm not saying that can't happen. But at some point, you've got to play a part in this thing and say, God, I believe in the Holy Ghost. I want you to speak through me. Give me the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And just if you got to just say, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. And just let the Lord speak through you. But so many times people will come down and they'll, they'll want to receive the Holy Spirit. And you'll, you'll try to get them to, to go in that direction and start praying. But they sit there like they got a, a padlock on their mouth. Do you want the Holy Spirit? Mm-hmm. You love Jesus? Mm-hmm. You speak? Mm-hmm. Sometimes you got to open my mouth. The Holy Spirit's a gentleman. So two things you got to do. You got to open your mouth. And also it has to be your decision to receive the Holy Spirit. You have to believe and you have to want the Holy Spirit. So I'm asking you this morning, who wants the fire of God in their life? Say amen. 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 All right, so that's what we're talking about this morning is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is the baptism of fire. The fire I'm talking about didn't die out with Jesus. It didn't die out with the apostles. Now, the same fire is still here today. Matter of fact, in 1901, it started spreading in Topeka, Kansas, when a group of people got together and started studying about the Holy Ghost. And all of a sudden, he poured his spirit out on them, and they started worshiping him, and they started speaking in tongues. It spread all throughout Los Angeles to Azusa Street. How many ever heard of Azusa Street? Oh, everybody probably heard of Azusa Street. Well, look, let me tell you something. It was so powerful a move. They said they brought the sick people out beside the roads. And Smith Wigglesworth, you hear me talk about him, he actually walked down the street and they said his shadow was healing them just like Peter did that day. Let me tell you something. When we get hungry for God and we get the fire of God inside of us, we're going to be able to see revival take place just like that right there. It did not die out. It's still here today. The only thing that hinders God from moving is us. It's the only thing. Look, when you get hungry, how many of you feed yourself? Well, I hope you feed yourself. <laughs> Praise the Lord. How many of you get somebody else to feed you? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you feed yourself, right? Man, you get hungry for God, guess what he does? He feeds you for you. He feeds you. He feeds you. Let me tell you something. God was moving and then there was Susan Street Revival, and the hell couldn't stop the fire of God as the Holy Ghost burned in their souls. They were hungry for something more than just church. They preached the gospel all across the land. Men and women of every race were filled with the Holy Spirit. It didn't matter about a race or denomination. If you was hungry for God, God was there to fill you up. There was hunger for more than this church. Hunger for more than just showing up and singing a few songs and, and sitting in the chairs. There was a hunger for more than hearing the preaching of the word that, that never would move a soul an inch from hell. They preached the gospel that had fire in it. Somebody shout, I need the fire this morning. Oh, I need the fire this morning. I'm telling you, we got to get hungry for the fire of God this morning. The fire hasn't gone out. We just need to put some Holy Ghost wood on it. Oh, yeah, some Holy Ghost wood. See, some of what's Holy Ghost wood? Well, you know, some of us, when we got baptized with the Holy Spirit, you couldn't keep your mouth shut. I couldn't keep my mouth shut. My wife, get it, she'd be like, looking at me like, what in the world? Because she wasn't baptized with the Holy Spirit. I'd be over praying. I'd be all in the Spirit of God. She'd be like, Lord, please shut him up. She's praying against everything. She's here, so I ain't just talking to her. She's here. But then when she got full of the Holy Spirit, it was all the way around. I was like, man, Lord. But see, my wood done got a little wet. See, some of us are wood and got a little wet. The thing that kept the fire going with the Holy Ghost might have been your prayer life. Oh, but Pastor, I've been saved five years now. I ain't, ain't got to pray like I did then. That's why your Holy Ghost fire is burning out. Oh, Pastor, I've been saved for 10 years now, 15 years now. I, I ain't got to pray like that. That's why your Holy Ghost fire has gone out. Oh, somebody needs a Holy Ghost pray. Oh, I don't have to praise like that anymore, Pastor, because cause now I'm in a great, the church has grown. There's more people here. That's, that's your fire going on. Holy Ghost praise. Now I'm telling you this morning, there was a hunger there. And we got to have that same hunger this morning. I'm talking about the holy praise 
that shakes hell this morning. I'm talking about a Holy Ghost praise this morning. I'm talking about a Holy Ghost shout this morning. I'm talking about a shout that will move the mountain. When we speak to that mountain, the trees will start to move. We won't know what's going on, but it's the Holy Ghost moving as we speak into the atmosphere. I'm talking about a Holy Ghost dance that releases the fire of God that's shut up in your bones this morning. Some of you have it shut up in your bones and you're not releasing it. Oh, you're not releasing it. The Holy Ghost is wanting to come out. When that Holy Ghost fire starts to take place, guess what happens? Sinners are starting to come into this house. They'll know that the Holy Spirit's here. They'll know that the Holy Ghost is in control here. We need sinners to know that. We need sinners to feel the power of our prayers when we meet here on Tuesday mornings and Tuesday night. When we start praying and we speak out into this atmosphere. Look, I do it all the time. I pray. I say, Lord, touch my nephew. Lord, touch my brother-in-law. Lord, touch right where they're at right now, God. I pray that you touch them and they feel the power of God. And then next time I see them, I'll say, what was you doing on such and such day at such and such day? If I remember. You know, sometimes somebody will say, you know, I, this is the weirdest thing happened to me. I was doing something, but I don't know if something just told me to do something else. And just smile and say, I was praying heaven down right now. People need to feel our prayers in this place. People need to know that when we pray, we're praying down heaven. You know, a lot of people don't accept the Pentecostal belief. A lot of your friends probably don't. But you let something happen in their life, and who's the first one they come to? Would you pray? Would you have your church pray? Because they know we pray down the power of heaven. Your family nor my family will be drawn to this house until we get the fire of God inside this place burning. Look at what the fire of the Holy Ghost did to the apostles and, and those that followed them. Everywhere they went, they converted people. Are we converting people? They just didn't go to church, beloved. They were the church. They were the church. Matthew 3, 11 and 12 says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff, which is unquenchable fire. Let me tell you something. There's something stirring inside of you this morning. You need to believe that God's up there doing like this, waving his hand over you, trying to stoke that fire inside of you, trying to revive that fire that you had inside. Maybe the fire that was once there, when everywhere you went, you spoke about the Lord, and now it's starting to die out. But God's up there this morning sitting there going, Oh, feel the breeze of the Holy Spirit blowing over you this morning. Let that fire rise back up inside of you. Let the fire of God rise back up. Oh, yeah. Now, I want you to notice in that scripture right there, there's not one thing that mentions about denomination, religion, race, any of that is in there. The Holy Spirit is for everybody that wants it. Everybody just don't want it, and that's fine. But for those that want it, he's here to give it. And God showed me something I shared with him in staff today about fire. The fire of the Holy Ghost, but just the fire in general, it draws people. It draws people. Look, it can be 150 degrees outside, and somebody can go over and build a fire. And people will go over and just start standing inside, start talking. There'll be 20 people over there, and they'll walk over here. Now, they may not get real close to the fire. It might be like Tabitha, and they stand a little bit away because it's a hot day, but they got to get near the fire. And you know, if you notice, at nighttime, bugs and stuff, they fly into the fire. The fire draws people. You know, when it's cold outside, and they, we go camping a lot, and there'll be a little fire going on, and they'd be, be fighting to get next to the fire. It'd be everybody standing like this, and you got to kind of ease on in there just to get a little hot on that side, and then you got to ease back out, and ease back in on that side. I like to get both sides hot. <laughs> but something draws people to the fire. My question this morning is, are you drawing people? Is the fire of God inside of you that is drawing people to the church? Is it drawing people to the Lord? There's one thing to be baptized with the water, but there's another thing to be baptized by the Spirit of God. Once you give your life to Jesus, guess what just happened? You become a perfect candidate for the Holy Ghost. A perfect candidate. You are able to possess the power and the authority 
of the Holy Ghost? Are you a witness? The fire, you got to understand, is for purification, the Bible talks about. We need a baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. In the book of Acts chapter 2, we find the results of the Holy Ghost and fire. It not only caused 120 people to speak in tongues, but it gave them power to be witnesses to people of that time and that day. It gave them power to heal the sick and to cast out devils. It gave them power to transform the lives of 3,000 hungry souls in one meeting. Man, can you imagine? What could we do? And I believe as Pentecostals, we have a message in the book of Acts that tells us the Holy Ghost is real. And we have the experience to share it with everybody around us. We have been commissioned, given a task to evangelize, to baptize, and to teach. That's what the Word of God tells us. We have been given power to cast out devils, to speak with new tongues, to tread on serpents. And I believe it's time for the church to fulfill the calling that God has put upon it. Somebody needs to shout, I need the fire. Oh, hallelujah. Let me tell you something. Charity, you may be called to sing. You may be called to sing. Play the drum, whatever, minister, whatever it may be. But God has called us all to be an effective witness for him. And sometimes the only way we can be that witness is to have the power of the Holy Ghost inside of us. Some of us need to be a witness this morning. Acts 2, 1 and 7, it says, When the day of Pentecost fully come, they were all one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And then right here, here comes the promise. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled. How many of them were? All, all were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this noise was abroad, or meaning the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confounded because every man, that every man heard them speak in his own language. Look, when the fire of the Holy Ghost is there, everybody comes around. It said that every man. Mm. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? There were at least, they say, 17 different nations that were represented that day that heard the word of God in their own language. This is what the fire of God will do. It will purify or teach the unlearned. The fire of the Holy Spirit will make unbelievers into believers and worshipers of God. Acts 2, 43. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Matthew 5, 14 and 15. The fire of soul willing. Winning. You are, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and give it light unto all that are in the house. Are you being a light this morning? And then the commandment of God comes, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. There's a fire of conversion. Luke twenty two thirty two 32 says, But I have prayed thee that thy faith fail not, and when they are converted, strengthen thy brethren. Fire and praying, Acts 4, 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke with the boldness uh, with uh, God and with boldness. Mark 16, 15, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. There's fire in the worship. Psalms 95, 6 and 7, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for he is God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, let me tell you something, beloved. This morning, you need to be hearing the voice of God telling you to get hungry for him this morning, telling you to get ready to receive the power, to receive the fire of the Holy Spirit today. Some of you need fire of a fresh vision. Some of you need the fire, oh, fire of boldness to speak around those around you. The fire of revival. Somebody just needs the fire of God this morning. We need a baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. We need the, uh, God's Spirit to break out. 
in this place. Oh, yeah. Somebody said, we need a breakout moment. <laughs> Come on up, Molly. We need a fire, though, here in this place. I'm talking about the fire, kind of fire that nobody can put out. I'm talking about the kind of fire that you can't stomp out. You know when the fire gets outside the pit, everybody wants to go stomp, get that fire. No, we need to be like wildfire starting to spread everywhere. We need to be the type of fire that water can't even put out. We need to be the type of fire that the fire department can't come down here and put out. We need the Holy Ghost fire so hot that we will break down the doors of this church and blow outside. And people will see the fire of God coming. And next thing you know, we'll have sinners busting in this place. Why? Because there's something drawing them here and it's the fire. It's the fire of God. We need to be so hot in this place that the fire marshal calls us up and makes sure that we're up cold. Beloved, I'm telling you, we need the message of God to be so hot and on fire that men and women will cry out and say, what must we do to be saved? That's what revival is all about. Saving the lost souls. We not only need the fire in the pool pit, but it needs to be out there as well. It's got to be there. We need people that have the fire to be a witness and an effective witness at that. We need fire in our prayer meetings, fire in our discipleship classes, in our children's church, in the youth. We need fire in the musicians and the singers. We need fire everywhere in this house, and we need fire to be fire carriers. We need a genuine Holy Ghost fire of God to sweep through this place and purify our cold hearts and set us on fire again. Let me tell you something, beloved. Don't think you can't burn out. Don't think you can't let the fire die out. Because just like a fire, if you don't put something on it, it dies out. It's up to you to continuously put something on the fire. You know, that fire can get all the way down to about nothing. You can go over and blow on it just a little bit. Put a little twigs on it. No fire start back up. That's where some of you are. You got that fire going inside, but it's just not burning where it was burning before. There's nothing wrong with it. Just revive the fire. God, put that fire inside of you. Revive the fire. When you get this type of fire, let me tell you something. You won't want to miss a prayer meeting around here. You won't want to miss a prayer meeting. You won't, you won't be late for church ever again. Why? Because you'll be so full of God, so full of, of the fire of God, you'll say, i got to do whatever it takes to get into that church. Whatever it takes. I don't know about you, but I'm ready for the fire of the Holy Spirit in my life to be even stronger. To be even stronger. And as we look around this, this world, this nation especially, the church is dead and dry. And let me tell you something, as dead and dry as it is, just a few people in this room could start a fire that would spread. You know, when it gets real dry, just the slightest little spark could start a fire. And it just spreads, consumes everything in its path. The fire of God will draw people from every walk of their life good thing about it is the same fire that draws them is the same fire that can fill them. And that's the same fire you can have this morning. Amen. Stand to your feet for just a moment. Father, I thank you this morning. Thank you, Father, for the individuals that came into your house this morning. And I thank you, Lord, that you've allowed me to have a few moments with them. And Father, I pray today, God, that they are hungry for you. They're thirsty for you, Father. I pray, God, that they're wanting the fire of the Holy Spirit revived inside of them. Father, those that may not have the Holy Ghost, I ask you this morning, Lord, that they would be quick until we're going to receive it. But Lord, those that need a refreshing, I pray today that they would be refreshed in the name of Jesus, Lord. God, I pray that we would lift up a praise unto you today. God, send the fire of heaven down on us this morning, Lord. Do it, Lord. Do it by your Spirit. Father, I thank you this morning, and I give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, look, Molly's going to lead us for a moment.
If you have never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but you want it, then you need to come down here this morning, and we're going to touch and agree and pray for you and believe that God will fill you with His Spirit. And if you say, Pastor, I have the Holy Spirit, but I need to be refreshed, you come down, and we're going to believe for refreshing this morning. But, beloved, I'm telling you something today. I would not be your pastor this morning if it was not for the Holy Ghost. Does that mean that men that don't have it or not? That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying in my life, where I was at, I would not be here today. Because there was a many a times that I would look at the store and want to go buy a beer. I was an alcoholic. The Holy Spirit would say, don't give way. Don't open the door. And I tried to negotiate, but Lord, it's just one beer. I just cut grass. It's 98 degrees. It's just one. And don't open the door to the enemy. Don't open the door to the enemy. Oh, Lord, I, I'm just going to look at the computer for just 30 seconds. It's not going to hurt anything. Don't, don't open the door. I won't hurt, it won't hurt to go out with my friends for one night and go to the bar. Don't open the door. Don't open the door. But if you don't have the power of the Holy Spirit living inside you to quicken you and convict you, guess what will happen? You'll get that one beer. You'll walk into that store. You'll look at that computer. And you'll do it. The power of the Holy Spirit will save you from that. Maybe it was just me. Maybe I was just weak. I don't know. But I know I wouldn't be here today without him. I know it for a fact. But praise God, he convicted me, quickened me. I said earlier in the first service, and I say it today, if you're not praying and asking God to convict you every day from your sins, then you don't want the fullness of God. Because if you start asking God, convict me when I'm doing wrong, you'll be surprised at what you'll stop doing. But if you're just getting up and saying, it's just a glorious day, then maybe you don't want to stop doing what you're doing. The Holy Spirit will help you in these things. Beloved, if that's you this morning, I want to encourage you to come down. Let us pray with you. Now, if you got any other prayer needs, you come down and we want to pray with you. This morning, if you don't know the Lord in your life, that's the, that's the first step is receiving the Lord. So if you don't know the Lord in your life or maybe you backslidden and walked away from Him and, and you want to come back to Him, well, look, you come down here too and we want to pray for you. God is a good God. He's faithful. He's just. Look, just because you slip and fall, don't mean he's kicked you out the door. No. He's right there where you walked away from him. He's right beside you. So if that's you this morning, you need the Lord in your life, you come down. Anything I've mentioned, you come down. I'm not trying to cut off the call. I'm just letting you know the altar is open for you. Amen. Go ahead, Molly.
Father, we thank you for your presence today. I thank you, Lord, for the time you've allowed me to have with your people. And God, I pray today that they was refreshed in the Holy Spirit. God, those that, those that had a burning ember inside of them, I pray that you've blown a breath of fresh air upon them, that the fire has been rekindled, oh God, that we would be a witness for you, Lord. Thank you for it, Father. Now, Lord, I ask you today to bless your people. I ask you to be gracious to them. To lift your countenance upon them. May your face shine upon them. I call them blessed in the city and blessed in the field. Blessed when they come and when they go. I ask you to bless their homes, their health, their wealth, their children their families, their jobs, their businesses. Father, I pray that they may prosper in all things just as their soul would prosper. And as the enemy would try to come in like a flood, I ask you to lift a standard against them. In the name of Jesus. Father, let us be a light on the candlestick and not under a bushel for you. May we leave this place today on fire for you, Jesus. And I give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we give the Lord one more hand clap? Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Hey, don't forget about Tuesday prayer, Wednesday night service. And look, if you want one of them chicken cue plates, she's going to be out there. You better grab one up. Five dollars. Amen. <laughs>